Hey, Elvir. Pleasure. Hi, Friedrich. Hi. Hi, Garrett. Hello. Hi, Albert from Moscow. Good to have you here, indeed. We're very pleased. Uh, the, the discussion that we just had with uh, Port of Busan is very interesting because we're starting to talk about uh, multimodality uh, with the new PCS on blockchain, which is one of the unique business cases in the world. Uh, so let's deep dive on multimodality uh, for this morning. Um, yesterday, we started to talk with different sessions on energy transition. Uh, we started to talk about multimodality. Uh, one key thing that Elvir mentioned to me uh, a few days ago when we were preparing that session is we need to take at some point a holistic approach, uh, at least from a European perspective, but also from a global perspective. But if we deep dive um, in Europe, Elvir, you are telling me that for the top 10 ports of Europe, right, we have 150,000 port calls. And these 150,000 port calls represent 40 million of truck. So we need to think different at some point if we want to tackle the energy transition and green greenhouse gas emission and, and to go down on, on multimodality. Uh, so, Fredish, um, in, in the context of the Inland Port Federation that you present and Afenvien, indeed, what do you do? What are things that you do today you know, how do you do it to reduce CO2 emissions for multimodality? Yeah, thank you for this question. Well, actually, uh, European Federation of Inland Ports brings together uh, about 200 ports in Europe. So there are a lot of things are going on. I would like to group them um, because um, it's uh, not worth to, to mention all of them uh, and to point out just one or two. Uh, the first uh, group being uh, everything that comes uh, when it get, when, uh, about uh, the uh, alternative fuels infrastructure. We have uh, hydrogen, which is uh, very promising for international waterway transport. Uh, we are doing uh, onshore power supply, especially when it comes to cruise ships. Uh, the second group I would uh, call um, everything that has to do with uh, clean vehicles uh, and clean uh, transport alternatives. For example, uh, trucks or lorries uh, being electric. Um, and the third one uh, is, uh, is, a, uh, uh, is the, the possibility to do uh, even multimodality electric. Uh, for example, we in Vienna we have done in 2019 uh, as we called it, the e-truck day, where we moved from, um, from Netherlands uh, flowers to Vienna, south of Vienna, uh, fully electric. Um, we're bringing the, the, by trucks, uh, electric trucks, to the terminal and we uh, moved it from Vienna electrical to the, to the destination. So it is possible already to do that and I think we should do that and uh, even if the business case is difficult. And today we are talking a lot about EV, uh, EVs and electric truck, but from a last mile delivery. Two years ago, Elon Musk launched, you know, his semi truck. Yeah. It's, it's not there yet, but we understand maybe end of 22. Do you think that you know it's going to happen? And we're going to get talk with Garrett later on on this. But electric truck is important. We are all on EVs right now, on personal vehicles. Uh, do you see uh, any short-term future on your side on electric truck from an inland perspective uh, in Europe? Well, for the last mile, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a quite dense uh, network when it comes to railroad uh, in Europe. Um, it has to be improved, but. Uh, I would say we could use electric railroad uh, more efficient and even uh, uh, do better there. And uh, for the last mile, I would say, yes, we do need electric trucks uh, in order to reduce CO2 emissions. And when it comes to multimodality, I think uh, we have to mention that uh, a modern uh, truck has about 100 grams per ton per kilometer, uh, emitting 100 grams, uh, whereas a modern uh, inland vessel has just 10 grams because of economies of scale but uh, it is a really a sufficient, uh, sufficient uh, reduction. Um, and because of that, we have to set on multimodality, I'm sure. So let's go on on electrification with Albert. Albert, um, as David said, you're a CEO of, of Global Ports uh, with two flagship terminal, uh, one in St. Pit, St. Petersburg and, and Vosoni on Far East. Um, you have been already starting your journey on electrification of terminal, especially in Sunpit, right, Albert? 
Yeah, yeah, Pascal. Uh, good day, good day, everybody. Yeah, really, we see this as a big part of our development. Global Ports has marine terminals in Russia's two key basins in the Baltic shore, St. Petersburg, and in the Far East. For us, this journey is first is about electrifying our main operating tools, the heavy machinery for cargo handling. In our case, the Northwest terminals were pioneers on electrification. Our container terminal in Usluga, it's also one of our facilities on the Baltic Sea. Uh, it was designed with the idea of using ERTGs from the start of operations in 2014. So now we are gradually installing electric machines all over the Global Ports facilities in uh, Northwest. As for the Far East terminal, uh, uh, VSC terminal, we are switching container handling operations from well-known diesel straddle carriers to RMGs. And maritime transportation and ports industry has been moving towards the electrification for some time now. For us, it is logical and necessary step, both in terms of business strategy and long-term environmental effects. And additionally, port industry, being in the front edge of global economy in recent years, has been truly striving for ESG development. Both ambitions and environmental efforts are growing stronger with shipping lines and ports. And we at Global Ports are focusing more and more and more on topic and what we are, what we can achieve here. And in addition, just uh, some uh, Russian, I would say, the, the, the country highlights. There is a, uh, a pretty interesting initiative and we do expect somewhere next year, uh, late next year, the test of uh, electric uh, commercial truck launch between Moscow and St. Petersburg. As, as maybe you know, around 700 of kilometers along the M11 uh, road is equipped with all necessary infrastructure and we do expect this test to happen next year. So uh, that demonstrates that we were starting with uh, further to talk about e-trucks. I mean, it's, it's getting there. Uh, it's very interesting to look at. Um, Today, we're going to look at multimodality in different aspects. So one has been electrification, and, and, and now we're going to move with Garrett, uh, especially in, in terms of, of innovation. You are looking today on multimodal massive hubs, right? Uh, from a citizen perspective, but also from a cargo perspective. What, what is the way forward? And, and, and also, we'd like to see, because it's one of the aim of that event at Smartport Bissian, is how can we work all together in Europe on a global scale on some specific uh, focus areas? And I'm sure that multimodality is one. Thank you. Um, we're <coughs> currently investing um, in a significant set of projects on logistics. Now, I, I, I work for EIT Urban Mobility. Now, our, our concentration is on the last mile, and we trust lots of the work that you've already highlighted from Moscow the stuff that's going on in, in um, Vienna. But our issue is that point of the handover between large-scale trade and when it comes to that last mile, which is one of our main polluters. Um, we're doing some innovative now, while I'm very enthusiastic about electric vehicles, um, we do have to remember the amount of power yeah. and the amount of electricity we will need so if Spain was to take away all of our combustion engines tomorrow, we would need three times the amount of electricity. So it's a systemic change. We need infrastructure investment. We need infrastructure points uh, throughout the whole length of the roads and the rail infrastructure. But when it comes to the citizens, we do need to start asking questions if electricity is the answer there. You know, we may have to consider if we actively want greenhouse gases to go down, we might have to sacrifice some things we're used to. You know, immediate delivery, we've become accustomed to, but that's not free. It might appear free to you, but in reality, we might have to consider a project which we've been funding in Barcelona, the, the HALO project, where we have local collectives with cargo bikes, and they take over the postcode deliveries. Now, up to a certain number of kilos, of course we can do that. It's pedal powered, it's owned by the community. We've recently been working with Stockholm on something similar. These are real innovation. If we just look for incremental difference, we might not see the gains we expect. Um, the other option we're looking at is that multimodal points of interchange between electric vehicles, um, we don't just need to use them for 
passenger transport. You know, if we have shared car infrastructure, um, how often will it be used? Will you be able to open the book, put some packages in there, leave it for, to be picked up with the code? Some of our car companies are looking at how we can use space differently. Um, but the challenge we're finding is the systemic approach. Um, the wonderful opportunity to talk with you about what this means. We see ports as being essential. You are intended to be slap bang in the middle of our cities. You have prime property, you know. You're so close to our citizens and we need to find a better way to cooperate and we look forward to, to more opportunities to develop that with you. I understand that the model that you have really at, at, at your lab, at, uh, it's really about building communities, yeah. uh, coalition of communities. So I mean, we're... Well, we are building communities, but we have lots of communities of interest. We're about making money and about you making money and us making money. So one of the key things we want to do is we will do high technology readiness, implement with you, and we put money in and we will share the benefits of your success and we will reinvest that money in more innovation. It's not for our salaries. So the perpetual innovation fund that we're developing is key. So this is a, a new way of speaking in Europe, a new pro-business approach, which is a challenge to all of us. We have to change how we think about EU funded programs, our relationship with business and with the citizen. Um, and that will be the change when we see that the financial benefit and success for all partners is part of that ecosystem change. Great, great. Um, we will there, we're going to talk about tech, tech in multimodality. And I have to say that we started the conversation yesterday at lunch, close to dozen of mega yachts, you know, in Barcelona. And I have to tell to the world today that, I mean, being all together for the first time for the two, last two years, really all together in Barcelona is fantastic. I expect that we all going to be able to do it soon um, in, 20, in 2020. Um, just at the time of COP26, uh, I mean, last week, uh, on, on, that was on Monday in Paris, President Duque, the president of Colombia, uh, was visiting Paris and he was introducing a, a new buzzword, uh, interesting enough, as his baseline, sus, tech, tech, sus, technability. You know, it's, it's a little difficult to pronounce, but he was saying that the importance of tech in sustainability. Um, how do you see tech? I think we're going to have a very, very interesting discussion with, with held here on this matter. What is the role of tech and how do you see the, uh, the way forward in sustainability? for mobility. Thank you, Pascal. And, and I have to say that was the first time I heard the word and it stuck to me because I think it's a very good way of describing. I think Garrett started the conversation here by saying that can we utilize the resources that we already have? Can we think differently? Can we utilize the cars to move goods? Great examples. And uh, I started thinking about it from the nation that I'm in and the port that I represent. Uh, what does technology mean and how can it support sustainability, sustainability, right? So if I, if I share some numbers, what, what you're asking, Garrett, for, that requires data transparency. In Sweden, we have north of 300,000 TEUs that are moving empty across the country. They're not moving empty because people want to pay for empty movements. They're not moving empty because companies want to put burden on the on the infrastructure and the on the environment they're moving empty because there is no transparency in the system that they are empty containers that can help move cargo like cars so for me sustainability means that we we make the logistic system as transparent as humanly possible to show where the assets are so that companies can reuse these assets in a sustainable way and that's for me the, the, the cutting line between tech and sustainability where one can support the other. Uh, th th thank you, um, Elvivir. So that we, we have a big challenge here. We're going to discuss later on, on on collaboration in the supply chain as well um, 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 with um, our friends from, uh, from Russia. Uh, with Albert because it's it's a very um, collaboration and supply chain collaboration is indeed super important. It's not only physical, it's also um, uh, digital. Uh, going back to Afanvien and the inland ports, energy transition, multimodality is really 
you have a number of roadblocks and challenges, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when it's related to tax, among other things, right? Yeah. It's tough time. It's not easy. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Yesterday we were discussing with Veronica from Prof of London about chicken and egg situation. What should I, what should I do? Where is my business plan, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there is something like a first mover disadvantage as well. If we look, for example, um, at uh, LNG terminals uh, at the Danube, um, well, um, I hope that they can be. Uh, uh, make some turnover with, with trucks, but uh, they will not uh, able, be able to, to make turnover and be profitable uh, with vessels because there are no. So um, it's uh, quite interesting to move. Uh, I, I think, on the other hand, we have to be innovative. If we, we are not, uh, if we do not innovate and if we do, do not uh, um, put the money in, then nothing will happen. So we have to do that. Um, at the moment, I would say that the business plans are not viable. But uh, so they have to be subsidized. That's a bad word, I know, but uh, we have to do that. Uh, otherwise, there will be no movement. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, the capacities that we have uh, on the inland waterways, especially in Europe, uh, then we have a wonderful capacity lying around. It's, it's not only the, the empty containers, as you, of course, uh, rightly said, uh, pointed out. Uh, we have so much capacity on, on the Danube, for example, uh, that can be used and that can be used without uh, polluting more than we're doing at the moment. So this, this should be used. And do you think that there is a gap between the Green Deal by itself and the reality? Uh, in that well, by far, yes of, yes, of course. Well, of course, there are uh, there are some some kind of uh, I don't know if this is the correct uh, translation uh, Sunday speech of politicians. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you have to do you have to do um, more in this in this case. We we we're talking about shifting to waterways since decades, and uh, there is some movement but it's not by far not sufficient in order to reach the green zone. So how, what, what do we need to do to accelerate? We need to have uh, alternative fuels infrastructure that has to be subsidized. We have to have a decision on what, uh, where, where do we put our money? Is it hydrogen? Is it LNG? I don't think it's LNG, at least for inland waterway, probably for seaports. Um, uh, and we have to move rapidly in order to have demonstrators uh, when it comes to vessels. Uh, we have brought together in Brussels uh, several ships um, that are existing at the moment. Uh, they were very interesting projects, but uh, not really, uh, not really viable and not really uh, reliable enough for for using uh, it day to day. But for sure, for a CEO, uh, the business case needs to be established, and it's difficult to establish it today. Yeah, it's yes, like in, in data collaboration and in supply chain collaboration. We have so many ways of doing it, Albert. Um, we, I, we understand I, in that you had a very intense growth uh, on the Far East, um, but the pandemics demonstrate also for you that collaboration from a data perspective was really critical. And we know that uh, Europe is home of port community systems where all trade logistics stakeholders partner in one neutral platform. Uh, there is a big need, right, in Russia and, 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 and for you to, to move to data collaboration, supply chain collaboration, right? Yeah, that's true, Pascal. Uh, and speaking about uh, Russian, uh, Russian case and Russian practice, we are, we're in the beginning of that, of that journey. So one of the main COVID effects that Russia ports have faced uh, in the shift of the cargo flows from the Baltic Basin uh, to the Far East, meaning that the cost, deep sea uh, lag cost has skyrocketed making uh, uh, m m making illogical to move containers to a traditional via traditional route and that uh, that actually lead to the increase of the load of uh, uh, dramatic increase of the load for the russian far eastern ports and and our terminal vsc so it's the multimodal route through russian far east to european hubs via the rail leg while not always cheaper now, is proving faster. 
it is a growing alternative uh, to the DC deep sea transportation and the delivery time from Asia to Europe is reduced by 20 25 days compared to the transportation via the sea since the end of 2020 and still now we see steadily growth in demand for container handling via the Russian Far Eastern bases with the shift in the Far East we see strong additional volumes both in Russian import and mainly growth in the transit volumes to Europe so we have a few examples, which I will touch a bit later. So speaking about the volumes, including booming volumes to transit, it's, sometimes, it's something we must now factor in our approach. We must think about how to grow, adopt the terminal capacity to respond to the growing traffic as soon as possible. And we need to factor to, in the situation at Russia-Chinese uh, border crossings. Uh, border crossings uh, between uh, Russia, Belarus and the EU and European Union. We need to factor also the smart IT infrastructure and how our terminals as multimodal hubs can provide efficient information exchange and transparency to customers, authorities and the railways. Uh, the multimodal transit services is a great example of where the supply chain digital collaboration is much uh, is much needed and already proved efficient. One of those examples uh, is actually Asia Europe 19, so-called AE19, uh, intermodal transcontinental service launched by Maersk Line that delivers transit cargos between Asia and uh, 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 Europe with a transshipment at global post terminals and using uh, Russian railways as a as a as a land leg. It involves the interaction of several, several terminals in Far East and the Baltics, customs authorities of different countries, forwarders, shipping lines, and integrating data from numerous IT systems. One IT solution that the services is run with it is a trade lens and a blockchain-based international system integrating data at all stages from all participants of the chain. It allows to track containers, freely transfer documents, exchange information with customs, and ensure the end-to-end -end transparency for all involved parties. Another good example would be the transit of sanctioned goods throughout Russian ports. It is a new opportunity for us since the legislation just recently has been passed and that allowed actually to uh, transport sanctioned goods via Russia using the uh, Russian ports and in the case the containers uh, must be sealed with the GPS or the GLONASS seals which are traceable at any given moment. We are now looking closely at this opportunity. And, and Albert, you were, you were telling me the other day that um, in, in this uh, <coughs> disruption of reality to the growth you have also um, a big question of quality of data, right? To obtain the data for the supply chain collaboration, indeed. Uh, that's true, uh, that's true. So uh, here actually, uh, here, here actually the, the, the main role is given to, uh, let's say, unified standards for the data, of the data interchange between all stakeholders. Yeah, th thank you, uh, thank you, Albert. Um, Garrett, um, you were saying that what is important to you in, in building these massive hubs, it's also transparency and impact. And we have been discussing yesterday, we are not here to talk and to talk about, like, you know, Sunday speech, you know, <laughs> uh, Friedrich, but I mean, really, how, what kind of impact do, do, do we have? And, and, and I, we understand also that regulation is one, in one end is important and taxation in the other end is also. And we just started to discuss about the issue of taxation. Um, what is your view on this? Um, I have to be very careful here. <laughs> I, I, I'm co-funded by the EU and, and we, we can't really make statements on taxation. However, uh, the first thing is that we know the ports across Europe have different models of historic financing and structure and governance. Some of them are run by cities, some of them are regional, and some of them report directly to ministries and capitals. So who's financing? If it's regional funds, city funds, there's a different makeup. But the problem, and I think it relates to what we've said um, in your example, is for have a truly innovative approach, there's a risk element and many of our ports have been around for thousands of years in Europe. You know, The risk elements necessary is um, difficult for boards or politicians to make. 
because they depend on data from previous work. Now, if we're trying to break the model, if we only depend on our data and our business relationships, we will do incremental growth, two, three percent. That's nice, but we want to do 10% growth, 10 times growth. So completely being dependent on our previous business models and our previous data, you are by default tying your hands. Now, to step out of that box is what we try and, and encourage. For example, an example that you shared, if we have unused space and there's a carbon cost to that, a brokerage system, because obviously logistics companies sharing information with each other will go to a competition authority and be complained by someone who's outside that network. To have a brokerage authority, it, it's that blind lack of direct uh, relationship, which means we couldn't be charged. So we have to think of new ways. We can't, we can't continue with the model. There's a level of trust, a level of risk that we need to be willing to take on to actually have that 10 times growth. Um, and I think that's where we could work with you to make sure we have access to the right people and get them excited about the change we can make, but that will require financial support. The Green Deal's underway. The Connected Europe funds are underway. There's a huge amount of money, but are we using it in a smart way? So that's why we'd like to work with you to, to consider the smartest way to use the money. And we'll all have to become uncomfortable in what we're about to do. It's new, it's different. And if we're not uncomfortable, then we need to think again in what we're doing. So I understand that you cannot talk about taxation, yeah. but what about uh, regulation. I mean, regulation, okay. you know, mm -hmm. it, we, we have two ways forward, you know, and we can use also regulation to move forward. You know, what, what is your view on this? Regulation doesn't come from um, a black box. You make the regulation. Our lobbying and our discussions and our facilitations with politicians, convening events in Brussels here, we decide the agenda. So it's not out of our hands, but we will have to decide what we want and what to push. So I, I wouldn't feel that Europe is a very consultative environment to work in. Yeah, that's true, that's true. But we just have to, some of the events can be dull and dry if you go to European conferences. But you know what? That's our conference. We can make that difference. And, and of course, this is a, a European view, uh, since the audience today is global. Yes. And we have different uh, regions of the world where uh, regulation is key. Uh, you know, uh, during the pandemic, we, we have been saying, for example, and, and, and digitalization, some top-down uh, from presidents regulation to move to um, digitalization of ports. You know, that was the case of Peru, for example, in May 2020. You know, that was really amazing. So it depends about where you are. We, we have all this discussion about the importance of regulation and, 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 and taxation. Elvier, going back to the, um, you know, these 40 million of trucks, and obviously uh, we got a problem, right? How can we fix from your angle, you know, the multimodality challenge, you know, at least from a, from a Sweden perspective or from a Baltic perspective? What is your vision there? Uh, look, the business model, I think th this conversation ties together. The business model of having uh, green trucks, of having green waterways, there is, no, there is no debating that the cost will be higher to the BCOs. We will produce new hardware, we will produce new infrastructure, the cost will be higher. If there is one thing we we'll learned through the pandemic is that there is room in the logistics system to pay more. I mean, pre-pandemic you could import a container to the European Union at a cost of approximately $1,200. Today you're paying $17,000. I'm not saying that that should be the business model. All I'm saying is that there is room to fund that transition. Now, the BCOs, the cargo owners, and all these millions and millions of transactions, Pascal, that could be offset by the tech data sharing. So the business model should be fairly simple. It will cost more to transport because we're using new updated hardware and infrastructure, but we could offset that cost by sharing data transparency on a true level. I, I, I really appreciate what we just heard here when it comes to data and blockchain and, and, and all that, but we still have to recognize the main problem. And the main problem is that it's still within silos. You get data if you use Mersk. 
But if you use three shipping companies, suddenly you need to be in three different uh, platforms to collect data. On top of that, if you're using 15 different truckers and truck companies mm -hmm. for the last mile delivery, it adds to the complexity, right? And sooner or later, you get data that's not accurate. Yesterday, you and me were talking about if you want to watch a Barcelona game yeah. on TV. Now imagine if, you are, if I were to tell you that the next Barcelona game is next week sometimes, and you really want to watch it because you're a true Barcelona fan. What you will do is you'll probably park yourself in front of the TV in the entire week and just browse to see, oh, now the Barcelona game is on. That is the reality of cargo owners today. If they expect cargo next week, they really don't know when it's coming, who is delivering it, what's the hiccup, and they need to monitor it all day long. If we were to create that platform, on top of that, if I just may continue what, what, what we just heard, the brokerage, I love that idea because there is one truly neutral partner in the logistics supply chain. And those are the ports because we have no profit monetary interest in that case. And I truly believe that it costs a fraction to invest in a global platform to show data that is already today accessible and free, but just in 20, 30, 40 different elements to piecemeal it together. It costs a fraction than it costs to, uh, from, from the green deal to invest in new mm -hmm. infrastructure. And we would probably get more out of it in terms of competitiveness and lowered emissions. And in Gothenburg, you are starting to implement a first platform with, with a PCS, as it has been in, in many countries in Europe. Uh, uh, right, it's starting recently? That is true. We, few we, days. we just launched it two weeks ago. Uh, the, the platform, uh, I, I know before here, the, the, the Busan port was showing yeah. the, the change in how they share data. Uh, it's basically what you've seen on the Busan port. The difference is we've, a, we've addressed an attack to show transparently what happens to the goods and, and the carriages once it leaves the port. When is the next empty container? Where's the railway? So you truly get a true end-to-end -end visibility regardless of which company or subsidiary you're using for your first mile, main mile, and last mile delivery. It is a somewhat complex system, but it turned out to be somewhat easier than we thought because all the data was already free. It was accessible. Mm -hmm. So we've created a first platform where as a BCO cargo owner, you can on one platform monitor your shipment from Shanghai to your warehouse in the middle of Sweden next to the woods and the ski slopes. And you can do that transparently and you can also share that data with the next company that wants an empty container to ship out so they don't have to call it up from Gothenburg 400 kilometers away. They can view that there is equipment available close to my zip code number and you can reuse it. But you have been telling something very important uh, to me is the importance of BCLs and the shippers, right? And we're starting to see, for example, in Europe, uh, the first one of the first unicorn in multimodality with Sender, for example, in, in Berlin, with matchmaking the shippers and the trucking company. So we have a lot to do uh, in Europe to have new platforms and to federate all platforms um, all, to, all to together. Um, so I think it, it's a very... Um, it's a very important um, subject. But uh, if I just may add to that, and I, again, I, I want to just tie into what Garrett said, we need to think differently. Sooner or later, we all probably know that at some point, ports will come to that point where we'll have to say no to vehicles that are not green. What about if we extended that regulation that we can do from a business perspective and also say, if you want to enter the port as a trucker or, or a carrier, you also have to share certain basic elements of your data. That's part of the transaction deal that we make. Suddenly it gives the ports access as a neutral partner, access to data that we don't have to ask and search around for. So I think we need to think creatively and, and, and what to do to create competitiveness to BCOs. In, in, in that end, I think that the, uh, in those platforms, you have two major parties. You have public sector and private sector, right? In Albert, I mean, from, uh, from your end, I, let's discuss about the role of the government. Yep. I mean, because we are talking about neutrality you know, in, vo in those platforms, in a multimodal environment. Uh, what do you see, what should be, what is the role of the government or what should be the role of the private sector from your end, Albert? I know this is a sensitive discussion all over the planet, right? 
and uh, you, are t you are talking about neutrality. Do you see the public sector having a key role where port authorities uh, could have some leadership? Do you see it run by the private sector? What is your thinking as of today? I, we definitely have some, let's say, some experience in Russia and some setups or projects launched by different uh, governmental authorities. But I would start from, from another point. It's, it's actually a very interesting part uh, we, we are touching here now. I think my colleagues from uh, port uh, community, from container terminals mainly, uh, they do know, they do understand what is EDI, EDIFACT standard, which many years ago was, let's say, created and adopted by United Nations uh, Conference for Commerce and Trade. And since then, we, we all use the, that standard, we, we use that standard files and messages, which actually uh, still are the let's say the, the the scripts of how to connect different stakeholders uh, within a supply chain when there is a container or container vessel involved so i do think that maybe uh, it is a, not a solution but an opportunity to test or to check whether uh, united nations conference might be the uh, might take the leadership or the ownership of the uh, of the platform of the basics of the platform which might set the standards or even rules for data transparency transparency and data interchange and speaking about the uh, russian port experience uh, it's it's now so the, the government role is about simplification of the processes uh, re reduction of the 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 the, the papers uh, eliminating potential competition and actually eliminating what government has created uh, previously. So there is a good example when uh, there is a project or the platform created under uh, Russian customs umbrella, which is called Seaport, uh, which is used along the old port locations of Russian Federation. It's a good uh, solution which uh, secures the information flow and transparency between the stake stakeholders of the process mainly about the sh uh, between shipping line agent between the port the terminal and the freight forwarder then some other authorities are involved but this solution does not cover all elements and all uh, uh, all all elements of this supply chain so there is a still a long way to go a fantastic, long way to go. I think it's the. Uh, I'd like that we move to the uh, last round of discussion around a specific subject matter that we has been started to address yesterday, Elvira and, and, for, and colleagues. Um, I listen a lot to what Garrett said. You know, uh, we need to have to build communities on, on our matter of multimodality. At ports, we are a good place to create a you know, to use a port community or the port ecosystem wherever we are. Um, what about a coalition of willing of, of working together on a local scale, on a regional scale, on a global scale, on some specific areas? We, we just got one question from the audience. How can we solve the problem of, of data, of getting the data from rail, you know, into the multimodality, getting the data from the truck? Mm. Uh, we know that in Hamburg, for example, rail is king. Rail is king. You know, they are doing everything that they can do on rail optimization. But let's discuss all together, um, you know, about building coalition. Does it make sense? Of course, Fredish, you said yes, because you are chair of the president of the inland port uh, eu federation so that would make sense but let's let's show about Gar garrett how how about building coalition of willings and I think, what about i think we have wonderful coalitions um, <clears throat> europe is very consensual driven but the objective can't be consensus and that's a very hard message we need a few ports and a few ports holding the hand of their home city to step up and say, this is risky, mm -hmm. we can do this, we have the appetite and lead. 
we can't wait for consensus. We can't wait for everybody to agree on the provisioning models. We can't. If we look at the results from my, my hometown, Glasgow, from the conference there, there's an urgency now. And I think urgency, whether it's inspiration or desperation, we can get some things done. So what you're saying is that because of urgency, because of time, we need to think different. We cannot work on the consensus and when 10 years yeah. that a EU directive yeah. is applied, you know, to, to fix the problem, we need to do it now, right? The risk appetite, the benefit appetite, and there's always the problem of first mover. Um, it can go very well or you can waste money. But we have to do something. And I think we use the existing networks we've got, but we look for those key risk takers and movers and we move forward together and set an example fast. Um, Fridish, uh, what about coalition of willing and multimodality? And, and if yes, how about where, with who? Well, first of all, I would like to say that ports are definitely able and willing to cooperate. Uh, I think we are here in an absolutely great example because this conference is, is, is a wonderful example for that. Um, I would say, and um, I think uh, this is a very good point, uh, Garrett, that we should uh, that we should have, uh, let, let's say, a, a leading team of, of ports uh, dealing with specially with special topics. Um, probably um, with whom was the question. Uh, probably we should do that around our uh, relevant network. For example, the Rhine has done it. The Danube is going to do it. Uh, we should uh, discuss the special problems that we have there, the special solutions that we can, we can do. And of course, we should uh, share our knowledge, we should share our data uh, uh, in order to, to grow together. Yes, um, yeah, great, great. Albert, what about the coalition in real, willing from a global port perspective? We are the part of this process, Pascal. We were born multimodal, all of us, so there is no other way. And the data transparency and data trust is the key. Elvir. I could not agree more, but I, I, I want to add that coalition is pointless unless there is a clear vision. What do you want to accomplish? Uh, I agree that a coalition should happen, but it needs to be tied to a clear, clear, clear objective. And that objective has to be tied to getting competitiveness out to the cargo owners, the manufacturers in the world. They are the ones that need to benefit. So a coalition with an objective, how to create competitiveness. We heard growth, 10%. What would happen if we created a coalition to have 2% less units, but they are 90% filled? Would that create competitiveness to the cargo owners. Yes, it would. So you need to have a clear objective of the coalition and there has to be a sense of urgency, I agree. And I don't think, I really do not believe it's complicated to agree what we need to accomplish because we all exist. All of the ports, all of the terminals, Albert and so on and so forth, we all exist just to create competitiveness to the business that we serve because they create wealth in the economy and the society and we all are better off. But what you're seeing, LVR is there is one stakeholder missing in this discussion that we usually have. The BCO is not here, right? I agree. So, and we are here for shippers and BCOs. So they have their word to say more than they have. They have to their creativity to bring on board. Yeah. And we have been working very often as silo, as port authority. We are focused on our terminal operator. We are focused on our shipping lines. We are focused on our multimodality. But sometimes we forget we have clients. You know, and we are here. You were talking about, uh, Garrett, about your focus on last mile delivery, and you have been seeing, you know, that the consumer is asking for right now last mile delivery. It's the same for e-commerce. And the same for e-commerce. You want to have your, your, your shoes that you buy immediately. Why? You may rethink this. And the role of, of the, you know, we have e-commerce, we have omni-channel, you know, so you can buy from yeah. any way, but we may discuss with the consumer as well, right? You know. I, th I think the crucial part there, Pascal, is in what you mentioned, who is the customer? Because we, in the supply chain, a port traditionally considers a shipping company to be a customer. And I think we need to redefine that. Is a shipping customer a shipping company a customer or are they a partner? Because what 
they do and their assets combined with the assets of Albert's terminals combined with the assets of ports we all work in the same chain to deliver to one final customer Absolutely. and that is the cargo owner so I think we need to also take the opportunity and redefine our relationship with each other and have the final customer. And our ultimate goal is to deliver to them a competitiveness, reduce emissions, improve data transparency, and perhaps even reduce growth in terms of units, but improve the utilization of the assets that carry the goods world around. And it could be enough to have 10 ports doing that. I believe so, yes. Yeah, and, and Al Albert, I mean, are you, for example, what do you think of uh, bringing the BCOs and the cheapers in, in this discussion from, from your end and from a coalition perspective? Missionary here, since we are, not, uh, we are not naming the freight forward as being the part of this process, it's, it's still something we need, to, we, need to, we need to test, we need to think or assess because now there is still lots of value which is brought by the freight forwarding community mm. to simplify the processes. But yeah. it's a good point. It's, I think it's a digitalization. I mean, as we accelerate as being a demonstrator of that, that, you know, with a new platform, uh, you know, the flex port of the world or the mm. photo of the world, you know, as digital freight forwarder, you know, rethinking the way that they're experienced. What is your position on that, on bringing BCOs on a coalition with leading ports, uh, Friedrich? Well, that's a good point, actually. But um, I think one should not forget who is paying the bills, right? So, um, yeah, and probably should do that. Is paying the yeah, bill, you know, yeah, you're right. You know, who is paying so, the shipping line, who is paying the yeah. terminal operators, the shippers and the BCO at the end yeah. of the day? Should be a good thing, yeah. Right. To do that. And, um, the, uh, we have uh, a couple of minutes uh, before uh, we, we, we conclude here, uh, so we are right on time. I think it has been a, a very interesting discussion altogether, uh, primarily saying two things uh, in, in a conclusion that to address multimodality on a global scale. First, and it was by a couple of us, you know, we, want, we need to create a, a group, a coalition of, of thought leaders, you know, of ports on tackling on a global scale the multimodality. And of course, here between Los Angeles, Montreal, Barcelona, Antwerp, Rotterdam, Hamburg and Busan, you have a f we have thought leaders here and maybe a good platform since they are a member of the chain port, the leading thought leaders of the world ports. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's something that we, we need to discuss down further down the road not in 10 years, but right now mm. after this event, I think it's... And the second thing is, Elvir really demonstrate the importance of two things. The first thing is BCOs and shippers. You know, we need to talk to BCOs and shippers, especially when it comes to tech. What do they want? You know, whatever new experience that they want, how they can refocus, uh, you know, the service and their own, you know, uh, customers experience that they have at the end when you, when you buy you know uh, fashion suits or, or whatever it's for and the end user consumer so we maybe need to discuss about all this supply chain mm -hmm. together it has been really a great pleasure to be with all of you today we thank you we find Albert we would have loved to Albert to have you here today in Barcelona uh, but that's okay it has been a connection is very good so it, it, it's very good uh, thank you Albert thank you Friedrich uh, thank you Garrett uh, for your leadership also on that and 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 thank you for tech for such technability you know indeed like President Duque was saying thank you thank you super thank you Pascal Sweet day.